you've ever met somebody, and hopefully you're not this way. I, I know I can be sometimes negative, and Brenda has to, you know, pull me aside, and I'm so glad that the mama of this house is feeling better, and aren't you glad for that, too? But, you know, she has to pull me back and say, Hank, you know what? we gotta, we got to look at that different. But you know how the big saying is, you know, is the glass half empty or is it half full? And it doesn't matter. Some people will never see it half full. They'll always go and gravitate towards the negative. Have you ever met people like that? They just gravitate towards the negative. Something happens in the earth, solar flares, eclipse, uh, a nation attacks another nation, something, you know, gets, you know, um, where it looks like, you know, some kind of uh, tragedy of some sort, and people always gravitate towards the negative. And I've been watching that over the last four years. There's a lot of things that would easily bring us into fear. There's a lot of things that we can gravitate towards the negative. Because listen, I just filled up my car the other day and paid $4 and some cents a, a, a gallon. I don't know, maybe in California it's like $200 a gallon or whatever. But the bottom line is I didn't like it. But I didn't complain. I just kept rejoicing, saying, great changes are coming, God. Great changes. You've said it. Reset is coming. All right? And I began to prophesy to the gas prices across the United States that they will begin to shift. You know, I put some groceries in my uh, basket. I think it was a dozen eggs and some ice, and it was like 400 bucks or something like that. You know, I started prophesying, God, these prices are coming down. So it's how you look at it. And you have to be the same way with God. How many of you have ever had some bad news come to you? How many of you have ever had a situation that you're like, oh my gosh, I don't know what I'm going to do. And you feel that fear trying to grip your heart or that anxiety. If you know the character of God, that he is a God that changeth not, it helps bring you through your situation. And what it does is it activates the power of God. If you go towards the way of faith and the way of knowing his character. Now I say that because... God is a God of great compassion. He's a God of great mercy. And I've learned this in my life, and I've learned the principle. God always has a redemptive plan. In your life, even over the nations of the earth, as long as the Spirit of God is in the earth, those of you that are watching, a redemptive plan is a plan of help and hope. Now let's go back to Isaiah 54. I want us to look at this. For a small moment, and I've been trying to get this into your heart, into your spirit over the last few weeks, notice the adjectives. For a small moment, moment. Didn't say for a large moment or a small moment. Now watch the contrast. Have I forsaken you, but with great mercies. Okay. So what's greater? The small moment of being forsaken or what? The great mercy. So what's greater? The great mercies. And you have to understand that when you're facing bills that you can't pay. All right. It may look hopeless. It may bring you into a place of fear, but you have to understand that there's something that's working for your benefit. Let's say you go to the doctor and he starts looking at all your charts and all your numbers and he's calculating and he's looking at things and, and begins to give you a report that maybe you weren't prepared for. That's not when you go and feel like you're going to be forsaken or that you're going to go down this long road. You have to gravitate to the consistency of God's character. And that is this. With great mercy, he will come through because of redemption. Because of Jesus' blood that has already been shed, it is available to pull you through. That's why Psalm 23, verse 6 says, On a daily basis, you should look over your shoulder and say, Whoa, goodness and mercy is following me this day and all the days of my entire life. God was the one that said that. He wants you to understand that he is a God of great mercy. Now, look at the next one uh, in verse 8. I like this. Notice the contrast. In a little wrath, I hid my face from you for, notice the contrast again, for a moment, for a moment. But with everlasting kindness. If something is everlasting, they call batteries everlasting, but why do you throw them away, right? God's loving kindness, you don't throw away. When he says everlasting, he means everlasting. If he says eternal life in heaven with him, it doesn't mean, okay, 200 years later, when you're up in heaven, he gets tired of you. Hey, you're out of here. No, eternal life means eternal life. Everlasting means it does not and will not ever fail. It's forever. But notice the contrast. Little wrath for a moment, but now watch this. Everlasting kindness Will I have mercy on you, saith the Lord your Redeemer. Why is he bringing redemption in? Because he wants you to understand that just, as long as the Spirit's in the earth, he will always show help, he'll always show hope, and he'll always, always administer in his kindness and his mercy. Here's the problem. How many of you are familiar with what Jesus said in Matthew 16? 
God allows what we allow. He allows what we allow in our life, and he allows what we allow in our city. He allows what we allow in our nation. And I'm telling you, man, this last Monday, I felt from God, stay back, don't be on the camera on Flashpoint, pray over Iowa, pray over Nebraska. I'm just one of many that prayed. But God looks at something. In Matthew 16, he said that whatever you bind, in other words, whatever you restrict in the earth, if you say, no, you're not doing this, devil, in my nation, in my city, in my family, in my home, then it will be backed by the highest court of all. You know, these goofed up courts. How many of you notice the word of the Lord's coming to pass? Like feathers, they will all begin to fall. God said that months ago. And so you have to understand this about heaven. He will act according to what we allow. We are God's legislative delegates in the earth. Okay? He's looking for us to administer out his mercy, to cry out for his mercy in a time that we need judgment. Now, God's judging evil. God's dealing with wickedness. You're going to continue to see a lot of these people that are pointing their finger at others and indicting them and wanting to throw them in jail. That finger's going to point back on them. The boomerang's going to hit them. And you're going to see things begin to flop, like God said, and flip, which it's happening. Because God is doing something in the earth. And notice what he says, I, the Lord, your Redeemer. Verse 9, this is so important that you see this. For this is as the waters of Noah unto me. Okay, what were the waters of Noah? The waters of Noah, God said, listen. He didn't call them the flood waters of Noah, he, uh, or flood waters. He said the waters of Noah. He wanted the emphasis to be on redemption. That, yeah, the flood was ugly. Yes, the flood took out the deep state of things. Yes, the flood dealt with corruption and evil and wickedness. But what did it do? It reset the earth. And God had a redemptive plan of hope. That's why eight were saved in a boat. So that he could reset the earth and cause there to be a fresh start. This is what he's saying to us at this time. Even though it looks harsh, even though it looks evil, even though it looks hopeless. He's saying, look, I have a standard that I'm held to in the earth. It's called my promise. Amen. Notice what he said. It's the waters of Noah. And I gave a promise. I've sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth. God is held to his standard that he has set. Same way with the blood covenant with Yeshua, redemption. If he says that by the stripes of Jesus you are healed or you were healed, he is set to that promise that he has to. If you will claim what is rightfully yours, then he will act and make sure that that is honored. Same way. It's no different in a city. It's no different in a nation. And he said the waters of Noah, which is speaking of redemption, it's speaking of God who said, you know what? The waters of, of the flood were harsh, but the waters of Noah. It's a reminder to me that I have mercy that is forever. Notice what he says. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't flood it anymore. I've sworn that I would not be angry with you. I wouldn't even rebuke you. Verse 10, this is very powerful. For the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed. So you're going to see things in the natural sometimes. But doesn't change God. You didn't hear me. Doesn't change God. It's amazing when something bad happens, people start changing their perspective of God. They think he's the angry uh, ancient of days who has got a lot in his craw over the last, you know, centuries of the earth's existence or whatever. But he says, my kindness will not depart. Even though you see things in the earth, you have to tap into my kindness. Well, how is God going to show his kindness? By somebody in the earth demanding it. Somebody in the earth saying, God, it's ugly out here right now. But as your delegated agent in the earth, I am calling on your kindness. I am calling on your mercy. On. Are you here? Amen. And I'm going to give you an example. We showed it to you before. Neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord, that has what? Mercy on you. Now let's go to Exodus chapter 32. I want you to look at verse 1. I think this is one of the greatest examples of what I'm trying to share with you. That a whole destiny of a nation was dependent upon somebody in the earth that represented God's covenant. Right? His delegated legislative authority was given to Moses. And notice what happens. When the people saw that Moses delayed, because he was up there 40 days and 40 nights with God, and I guarantee you they were having peanut butter and jelly, because that is a heavenly... I love peanut butter and jelly, by the way. I think it's heavenly. And he delayed to come down out of the mountain. 
And the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said, Aaron, make us gods which will go before us. For this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land, we don't even know what's become of this dude. Now look at what God says. I think it's uh, verse uh, uh, 6. Look at what God, God says. So then Aaron tells the people to bring their jewelry and break it off. And so they rose up early, the people. They offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat, drink, and rose up to play. Now that word play is like in the most perverted acts that you'd ever want to not imagine, but it was really nasty. All right, look at verse 7. And the Lord said to Moses, get down. And I told the early service, I've said before, that's your first example of disco. You want to know where it's at? It is biblical. You see that? God told him, get down. And so no, no, uh, Moses, he, he cried out. You think Barry Gibb got that voice? No, that was, that was Moses' voice. He could, he could sing like that, staying alive. And he even went like this, you know. And the people which brought you out of the land of Egypt, they've corrupted themselves. Now watch God. Keep reading. And he had turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded. And they've made a molten calf, which was, remember, I taught you about Baal worship and Nimrod. They were bringing that in now, and God was very angry. And sacrificed and said, this be thy gods, or this be Baal, O Israel, which have brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Man, after ten plagues, man. And the Lord said unto Moses, I've seen these people, and they are stiff-necked. Have you ever had a stiff neck? Yeah, that's what, oh, these people were bad, bad, bad. All right, look at verse 10. Therefore, leave me alone. All right. This is the same God that said it's not good that man be left alone. I will make for him a what? A help me. Now, there's people that will argue and say, God didn't say I'll make him a wife. I'll make him a help me. So that could have been two. Eve could have been a dude. Uh, no, Eve gave birth. And if it was that God wasn't talking about heterosexual marriage, he wouldn't have said be fruitful and multiply because you can't get two women together married and be fruitful and multiply. Right? You couldn't have two dudes. So God was meaning only two genders. What Jesus backed up, by the way, because there's an argument, oh, later on in Judaism, the Jews twisted help me and made it husband and wife between a man and woman. You don't know your Bible and you don't know your history. Jesus said, uh, let me define marriage. It's between a dude with dude parts and a woman with woman parts. And they come together, right? And they can be fruitful and multiply and have more, right? That's what the definition of marriage is regardless if people like it or not. So God was the one that said it's not good for man to be alone. God was the one that created man, mankind in his image. He wanted somebody to be with. So God is not a God that wants to be alone. He was not saying this because he wanted to be alone. He was not saying this because he even would be alone. He was testing somebody in the earth realm that would give God a legislative authority to operate. And God, whose foundation is righteousness and justice, he cannot truly be a righteous judge. He cannot be a just judge unless he gives an opportunity for mercy first. Because you say, well, how is that? Well, if he's like the judges today that legislate according to the bench, they won't even listen to the evidence. They're going to declare you guilty without hear hearing any evidence. They already make up their mind. God has to, what the scripture says, mercy triumph over judgment. God always has to extend his hand of mercy first. Why do you think in Genesis 18 and 19, he came down to Abraham and he said, hey, this is what I'm thinking of, of doing. The cup of iniquity has been full in Sodom and Gomorrah, and I will not withhold from my covenant man what I'm thinking of doing or what I'm about to do. And God was seeing what the covenant man on earth would decide. And Abraham could only do what a lot of people do when it comes to the condition of their city, their marriage, their life, come on, their nation. They could only look at the bad. And that's what Abraham did. How in the world, when two angels show up at my nephew's house, that the, the angels are almost raped at the hands of the homosexual men? Wow, I can't see any good. There's, there's got to be. Is there any 50 righteous God said, no, 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 you know the story. They got down to 10, and God said, no, there's not 10 righteous. 
And Genesis 19, 33 says that God, just like this verse, Exodus 33, uh, 32, 10, God walked away to be alone. What if Abraham would have chased him? He said, hold it, God. I may not feel righteous, but I'm your covenant man in the earth. And even though that is a really filthy place, God, will you spare him on behalf of me? What would God have done? He would have done it. But because God's a righteous judge, his man on earth chose not to include himself as among the righteous. And the rest is history. I say that because I'm hearing a lot of people, when they talk about America, oh, it's never going to turn around. It's going to take years. I sure hope so in this 2024 election cycle. Oh, I pray to God if they don't steal it again. Yeah, that's probably a reality. But let me ask you a question. If we have people like Abraham, you'll probably see that happen. If you don't vote, if you don't include yourself in your ability to pull God's mercy into the earth, you don't realize how much you have that God is waiting on. Sure, I'm not putting my head in the sand. I recognize there is a lot of evil going on. But you know what? We are ripe then for God to show his mercy. Because people say, well, now they'll learn. Those that dress up with wigs, they'll learn that you cannot dress up as a woman and be a man. They'll learn. Wait a minute. What brings men to repentance? The scripture says it's the goodness of God. What does good do? It overcomes evil. No, we think that if God shows that he's an angry old man in heaven and he judges and wipes out all the queers and those that are confused with their gender, then the world will be a better place and justice will come. Wait a minute. It's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. It's good that overcomes evil. How many of you have raised kids? Do you know that my kids, I had to learn, and, and Jonathan, forgive me, Matt, forgive me. I, I had to learn later on in my parenting that all the years that I would scream and they would not listen. It was like your dog. If you, how many of you, I have three German shepherds. If I go, they're like. <laughs> but with authority, if I say, now listen, you don't poop in the house. In fact, I have people all the time say, man, your dogs have special commands. Yeah, they do. And one of them is, outside of the others, don't poop in the house. <laughs> right? But if I say it with authority, they hear it. If I'm just screaming and flailing my hands, they'll probably poop in the house. I learned that my kids respond and responded a lot better. Even as a pastor, my early years of pastoring, I was a lot different. Okay, I know you don't think so, but I was. And I learned something. There's different ways of talking to people and getting across the same message. Right? We're not going to cause the earth to come to God or come to us, Christians, when A, we're fighting with each other. B, when we got a twisted uh, understanding and revelation of the God that we serve. Now, I'm not saying God gets us because he already got us. Right? Now we need to get him. But here's the point. The point is there has to be something. Like how many of you ever read the old stories and it's documented in secular newspapers where, you know, Charles Finney or somebody like that would come in a revivalist and they would begin to, you know, pray for that territory, for that city. And all of a sudden the bars, without anybody telling them, picketing, right, or whatever, would begin to suddenly close down. There were people that in the city would begin to gather in the streets and would begin to cry and weep saying, I am sorry for my sin. Not one preacher, not one church service, not anybody playing the ukulele, you know, trying to get in the mood, you know, for you to change and make a decision to Christ. Come, there's room at the cross for you. No, there was none of that. It was the Spirit of God that came into the city because somebody dared to pray for the invasion of God. And it was God's presence. It was God's tangible anointing and glory. People were drawn to it. People would come in and say, I don't know why, but I, I, I feel terrible about my sins. Not one preacher. God. And they would fall on their knees and say, I need to know this God. I think we're missing something. 
We're looking at eclipse, and what do we do? Gravitate towards the negative. We have people gather together to hear the word of the Lord, and they come out. And I'm not knocking it. I'm just simply saying, I think it's deeper than that. America needs to repent. I agree. I agree. But America, the remnant who have repented, need to get in their prayer closet and don't be like Abraham and let God walk away in a moment and be faced to judge us because he couldn't find anyone in the earth in a time when we desperately need his mercy. They didn't cry out for it. Because they could only, like Abraham, see the perverted, twisted, mixed up culture of Sodom and Gomorrah. And I hear people, America's finished. Well, get out of America then. I don't need you. Our children deserve better than what they're getting. Our economy deserves better. Amen. Our universities. All right, let's go. Let's look at Exodus 32. Leave me alone. God didn't want to be alone. That my wrath may wax hot against them. And that I may consume them. Now, that is God's righteousness talking. That is God's justice talking talking he as a righteous just God with what they did they deserved every single ounce of punishment and they deserve the next part of this verse I will make of you a great nation you know what God's saying I'm going to wipe them all out and Moses the name of Israel will now be named Moses and today in our maps, we would look at that little country, and if Moses would have came into agreement with God's righteousness and justice over his mercy, we would be looking at the nation of Moses today. But God's delegated man in the earth that had the literal authority to not change God's mind, so to speak, but to change his position. There was no mention of mercy here, was there? I'm going to wipe them out, leave me alone. So what does Moses do? Watch. Moses besought the Lord. He said, Lord, why do you wrath, why does your wrath wax hot against the people? Man, I never bring an indictment against God. Now, I've asked him questions, and maybe that was a fair question, but it sure sounded, Moses, when I meet you, like you were giving God an indictment. Why are you leaning and going towards your anger, God? In other words, he's saying, where's your mercy? What are the people going to think that brought, that you brought, <laughs> what are the people going to think of the God who brought a whole nation, millions of us out here, out of the land of Egypt with great power, with ten plagues, and now you brought them out here to kill them? So how many understand, he was one man in the middle of a nation that deserved judgment, God's righteousness. God had every right to wipe them out. Watch what Moses does. First of all, he, he goes the way of mercy. God, yes, they deserve to be wiped out. But how is this going to look in the secular media? How is it? We don't think sometimes when we're fighting on social media, we're calling out whether someone's a true prophet, false prophet, uh, you know, a prophet, a uh, teacher. What, we argue and fight, and the secular media picks up all of that they have, and they put it in all their stupid tabloids. And that's why David said, you know what? We get the word, touch not my anointed. David was saying it based on the secular. He said, look, I will not touch Saul. Saul is a goofball. He is, he's wrong in what he does, but I won't touch him. I won't give any empowerment to the Philistine media. I won't by saying how I truly feel about Saul and even what he's done. If we would just take that position... And learn to love one another in the church, man, something would spill out yes. onto the earth. Yes. Look at verse 12. Watch now. Wherefore, the Egyptians would speak and they'd say, man, by mischief, God, you brought them out to slay them in the mountains. You brought them out to consume them from the face of the earth. Turn, O God, from your fierce wrath. What's he calling out for? Mercy. Again, mercy triumphs over judgment. It will. It will. It will. If the people are right about the eclipse being some great warning to America, rather than get into agreement with them and, and expect God's judgment, like one man said, well, it's over. Who are you? Get out of the way. I'm not leaving God alone with your kind of perspective. No, God, you're going to remember your mercy. 
you are going to remember your mercy. Because if you do, then mercy will triumph over the deserved judgment. God will come through for a generation that desperately needs him. All right, watch what he says. He goes back, go back to verse 12. He says, turn from your fierce wrath. Repent of the evil against your people. Oh, pretty bold words, Moses. But that's not the part that only got God. Watch now. He shifts, verse 13. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants. What is Moses doing right here? He's reminding God of what? His covenant. If you're facing something today in your life, the doctors are telling you this and this and this. That might be true that there's that disease or that symptom. But the fact is your covenant. God is bound by his word and bound by blood. That he has to honor his covenant. And that's what Moses was saying to him. Excuse me, you have a covenant. And, God, and Moses knew that when you come together in your covenant, especially when it's sealed by blood, whoever breaks the covenant would have to be destroyed. Right? Or there would be severe consequences. So he brings up the covenant. Here's the deal. We've got covenants right in our nation, folks. People that dedicated this country to God. That we need to stand up in the face of God and say, Lord, Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, but remember George Washington. Remember Ben Franklin. Remember some of those, Thomas Jefferson. Remember some of those that, yeah, the history will tell you they were all, you know, this and that. But here's the point. They were men of prayer, too. And they were men that dedicated this country, different ones. Come on. God, you are going to remember your covenant. And watch this. And you said, I'll multiply your seed. How can you, how can you say you're going to multiply if you're going to kill us all, God, except me? And look at what happens, verse 14. And the Lord repented of the evil. He wasn't going to do any evil. He was waiting for someone in the earth with legislative delegated authority to give him a chance to show mercy. That's what he wanted. He didn't walk away. Come on, how many of you, and you probably don't need to admit this. I remember one time, Brenda, you, you, if you're watching, we decided on one vacation, this is like 20 years ago, to clean out that God-forsaken place underneath the stairs. You remember that? How many of you have that place underneath the stairs? You don't even know what's underneath there. Well, we had moved into the house, and I didn't really, I just packed everything up, put them in boxes, and, and uh, moved them. I had no clue what was in there, and I thought, hey, I don't want Brenda to, you know, throw anything that could be of importance away, and I didn't even know what was in those boxes. And I shoved them all underneath the the uh, stairs, and she said, "Hank, what's in, what do you what, what's what what, we, what is all this?" I said, "Oh, probably a lot of yours and my stuff." She goes, "Hey, let's go ahead and go through it." I said, "All right, let's." You know, I'm thinking, "Yeah, it's only going to take a few minutes. We're only going to throw a few little papers away or whatever." <laughs> Brenda, I don't remember how many trash bags later. They, it was all my stuff, <laughs> and I got so mad at her. I said, "Brenda, I am done. I am done cleaning, and I am done." You have dragged me in the wilderness. <laughs> you, actually, you dragged me downstairs to mock me with all of these bags of sentimental valued items. And really, to be honest with you, my pride wouldn't admit it. It was junk. It was papers. All right. I saved the popcorn bowl. Uh, okay, you're going to think of really I saved the popcorn bucket. For when I went to see the Passion of the Christ, because I remembered I couldn't even finish the popcorn during the message, and it meant everything to me. And I saved it. And she says, what's this? So, Nothing, Brandon. Just put that popcorn bucket over it. She said, Hank, really, what is this? It's a popcorn bucket, Brenda. Why did you save a popcorn bucket? Brenda, it has significance. A lot of history with that, that popcorn bucket. She said, what history? A very special moment where my heart was touched with God. <laughs> Brenda, the passion of the Christ, when you and I went, I ordered popcorn and I couldn't finish it, remember? She didn't remember, but I did. And I ate the popcorn later, but I saved the bucket. <laughs> okay, stop it. How many of you would have saved the bucket too? Raise your hand and make me feel better. Thank you. I love you guys. Oh, I love you. I love you. How many of you think that's stupid? 
Well, I didn't ask you, okay? So, <laughs> so anyway, I'm bringing this to a close, Pastor Tuck. So, so, I don't know, 20 bags of trash later in the popcorn bucket. I got mad. I said, Brenda, this isn't right. You brought me down here, and we're wasting our vacation. And these things meant a lot to me. I said, you know what? I'm just going to go for a drive. And we made a rule. We made a rule. I've been married 35 years that you are not to leave. No matter how mad you are, you don't leave. Because when I was a juvenile court officer, kids, kids got in trouble because they watched their parents drive away and never come back. And I said, Brenda, we will never, ever do that. We will never, you don't, we don't leave. We don't, we don't leave. We don't go to mother-in-laws. We don't go to McDonald's. We, but I violated my own rule that one time. And I'm driving and God says to me, what are you doing? And I said to God, I just need to be, let, I just need to be alone. He said, Hank, don't play this game. And I turned around and I came back and I said, I'm really sorry, Brenda. Because ultimately I didn't want to leave. I was just trying to prove a point. <laughs> that could have cost you something in your marriage, so don't play like that. So I came in and repented. And uh, I think we added like 10 more bags to it or something. <laughs> but the point is, God didn't really want to be alone. He wasn't trying to get an attention. He was trying to see what his man would do. To give him a right to have mercy triumph over judgment. This is why you need intercess. Now watch this. And so keep reading. And Moses turned and went down from the mountain. And the two tables of testimony were in his hand. And the tables were written on both their sides. On the one side and on the other. They were written. Look at verse 16. Pay attention. And the tables were the work of God. And the writing was the writing of God. God wrote by his finger. So can you imagine? You've seen it in the Ten Commandments. You got the stone here, and all said, shoo. You know, I see the right. That would be intense, God. And the tables were the work of God and the writing. You know, I'd like to, if you did that for me one day, just do a vision. I'm just talking to him and tell him, I would, that would be cool, God. Write something for me. That would be awesome. So the writing was the writing of God, graven upon the tables. Now watch what Moses does. He demands mercy from his covenant friend, God. And watch what he does. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people, they shouted and said to Moses, there's a noise of war in the camp. What happens? Verse 18, and he said, is this not the voice of them that shout for mastery? Neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that sing I do hear. They were, they were mocking and worshiping falsely. And it came to pass as soon as he came nigh into the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing and the perversion. Moses' anger waxed hot and he threw the Ten Commandments, out of his hand and broke them beneath the mountain. Okay, so what did Moses do? Here he demanded mercy from God. And what did you see him do? He got over into justice. He got over into what? Judgment, anger, flesh. And you know why? God called him back up on that mountain and said, come up here. You demanded mercy of me and for the nation, and I spared him because of that. And now you're going to go act out wrong? See, God needs somebody in the earth who will let him show his power and his goodness and his mercy rather than always bending towards the negative. Are you hearing me? Are you listening? And so you know what God did? Called him back up the mountain and made him. You ever seen the Flintstones? I love that show. Remember how they would always chisel it out? Can you imagine how long it must have took Moses to have to chisel every single one of the writings of the law? Good lesson. Now you know where you get writing sentences from. <laughs> how many of you ever wrote sentences? And my dad would never let you line them up like I, 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 will, will. He's like, no. Nope. i allowed to do that. You write every sentence. Mom, he used to say, you don't line them up. You have to write a new sentence every time. My hand today, Mom. I don't know what the deal is, you know. So we're right into it. All right. Last scripture, and then we're going to call it a day. I showed this to you last week. Man, I didn't even get to anything. Psalm 106, verse 7. This is why this is important. Psalm 106, verse 7. Watch what God says. Praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Psalm 106, verse 7 now. Our fathers in Egypt did not understand your wonders. They did not remember the multitude of your mercies. 
Come on, have you ever gotten an argument with somebody and you try to justify yourself? Don't you remember when? I've had to do that with my boys before, right? Boys, don't you remember we did this, this, this? Matthew, I've had to, I've had to line you boys up a few times, you know. But he knows I'm teasing him. But anyway, it's true. Multitude of mercies. But you rebelled by the sea. You know how they rebelled? They complained. All right, last thing I want to show you. Isaiah 54, the waters of Noah. We're talking about that. Why was it called, verse 10, Isaiah 54, 10? We're going to look at that, and then I want to show you a couple prophecies, and Doug's going to close it very quickly. All right, for the mouth, uh, is it verse 9? Verse 9, sorry. Isaiah 54, 9, as the waters of Noah are unto me. Now, how many know he called them the waters of Noah? Does anybody know what the name Noah means? It means rest, okay? Here's another definition. I want you to hear this. And then they're going to put up a couple prophecies very quickly that you need to see. Noah's name means rest, but it also means repose, R-E-P-O-S-E. Do you know what the word repose means? A state of resting after extortion or strain. How many would say, man, we have been in the last four years, extortion, strain, harshness. All right, I want you to put up September 5th. uh, 5th. Okay, look at this, of 2019. Look now. For there will be a word that will appear. Do not be afraid, as it shall be a word harsh for just a little more season. Harsh snow, ice, winds, stream harsh cold. And yet where is the snow? It shall not fall, and there shall be no rain, but it shall be mild, and there. And this is not an ordinary season. God says you've not just entered into 2020, but you've entered into a decade that should be known as a decade of difference. What do I mean? The Spirit of God says, do you remember where I declared in my word that I would put a difference, and there would be light in Goshen. Pay attention, he's talking about light. Light in Goshen, but it'll be dark in Egypt. Certain plagues. Notice he's calling out a plague. And he even prophesied another prophecy that there would be a plague. So he's getting us ready for the decade. How many of you see it? This is 2019. And things would not touch the place of Goshen because I put a difference. I speak this to you who have fallen into a place of despair, a place of fear. What you shall enter into in this new decade, it will start off how? Hard. Have we seen that? Yes. But it shall come to a place known as what? So how many know, where's God saying we're heading? Rest. The days of Noah, the waters of Noah, God's mercy, God's kindness, and it'll be different. All right, now why do I say this? I want you to look at this prophecy, the last one, December 1st. This was in California, God prophesied. How many of you noticed the northern lights? They're saying in the news things that they haven't seen this brilliance of lights like this. According to Anthony, who did his research, this is the first time that they have on record that all 50 states have been able to see the northern lights at the same time. Okay, now pay attention to this prophecy. Those of you that are watching, pay attention. Pay attention to what God is saying, okay? We're coming into rest. He's trying to give us signs. This is extremely important, okay? They're saying that we've never seen these colors before. We've never seen these lights like this. There's even strange lights that's appearing in the lights. I've read those articles too. Some people are saying, are these portals? I've, I've seen the headlines. We're going to show them at Prophetic Pulse, but watch this. All right? So it should be, would be, says the Spirit of God, that there are many that are gathered here tonight. And those that are listening, and they're saying, God, we are hearing things that cause our hearts to be troubled, that cause our hearts to be in fear. Is there a day of justice? Is there a day of vindication? Is there a time, God, where you shall come and you shall bring about change? Now, God gives the answer. The Spirit of the Lord says, I've been speaking this and declaring this through my prophets that this is the time. This is the hour of great change. For I've said and I have declared before that there has been that which has been dark and there's that which has been gross darkness. But yet I am the God of the light. And I'm coming now in a way that you've not understood. I'm coming in a way that shall cause the darkness to begin to be what? Disrupted, interrupted, and abated. So he's telling you how we're coming into rest. Now look at the next part. For you will look up and you'll look into the clouds and say, what are these strange lights? What are these lights that seem to come from the heavens, even in our areas, even in our cities? What is happening with this strange phenomenon of moving light? Now that happened in uh, California just uh, last month or a few weeks ago. What is happening with this strange phenomenon of moving light and light that seems to have brilliance of color that we've not seen before? Now watch what he says in the red. But I will show these wonders across the United States as you head into 2024. And as you are in 2024, okay, have we not seen the wonders of light? It's been pretty amazing. Because I will show you that you have seen what darkness looks like. Now I will show you what portals are looking like with heaven's invasion, with angelic forces, and my light that is coming to break through the darkness, the corruption, and the evil that has come at this time. I want you to understand we're in a time of God's redemptive plan. 
And we need to remember that because here's the thing. It's, it's very, very important. If you don't understand it, then uh, the truth of the matter is you're going to get messed up in your perspective. Praise God. Pastor Doug, I want you to come. So God always has a what? God's mercy is what? Forever. It's forever and it's great. Never forget that. So what am I trying to say to you today? I'm trying to say if God listened to one man who reminded God of covenant and who called out for God's mercy when a nation deserved judgment, what can we do between now and our scheduled election? Which I want to share a word with you that came at um, Tim Sheets Church. on the front. 